بسم الله والحمد لله الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته everybody inshallah hopefully everyone is doing well welcome home welcome to roots alhamdulillah mashallah soul food uh, I'm gonna rename soul food sister study circle I'm just kidding <laughs> alhamdulillah mashallah we're happy that uh, alhamdulillah uh, the community is here and um, we will inshallah continue on with our series here the conversations of about being Muslim the conversations on being Muslim and Today, uh, we have a pretty heavy-hitting topic, uh, something that will be, you know, really kind of jogging a lot of people's thoughts and reflections, inshallah, because it is something that is so pertinent and so relevant to every single one of us, um, and that is the topic of how sins can affect a person and their heart, particular. And one of the things that I wanted to begin by sharing, inshallah, is that the heart is something as Allah Ta'ala, He you know, keeps on teaching us about in the Qur'an and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi He keeps teaching us about in the Hadith that the heart is a very, very sensitive part of your, 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 your soul, right? Now there's like that physical heart, but there's also that spiritual heart, right? The physical heart takes certain, you know, uh, a little bit of upkeep in order to keep it healthy, but all at the same time, the spiritual heart, the one that feels, you know, close to Allah, the one that feels guilt and pain and happiness and, and, and difficulty also needs a certain level of upkeep. And so this is why the Prophet Sallallahu he says in a very famous hadith about the heart itself, he says, Ala wa inna fi jasadi mughdatan idha salahat salah al jasadu kulluhu wa idha fasadat fasada jasadu kulluhu ala wa al qalb. He says that there's this piece of flesh within the body. And if it is good, right? If it is described as jasadul kulluhu, if it's described as jasad, that means that the rest of the body, that it will be salahat salah al jasadul kulluhu, that it will be straight, it will be righteous, it will be upright. But wa idha fasadat, if it is corrupt, then the rest of the body will follow suit. And he says, Ala wahi al qalb, that indeed this is the part of the body that's called your heart. And subhanAllah, you know, that, that, that statement that a lot of us have kind of heard, follow your heart, um, before it's become like a romantic thing, I want everyone to know that it's actually a spiritual statement. That a person who actually listens to the reality of their qalb, their spiritual heart, more likely than not, they will be guided towards making the right decisions. Only when a person goes against what is natural, what is kind of, you know, their, 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 their natural disposition given to them by Allah, that is when the heart and the rest of the body, according to this hadith, begins to suffer. There's a really beautiful hadith that I wanted to share with you guys. It's like a story. Uh, so the Prophet ﷺ, when he went on that famous journey called Isra wal Mi'raj, the time where he ascended from you know, Al-Aqsa, he went from Mecca to Al-Aqsa to Quds, and then from Aqsa, from Quds, he went up to the heavens. And this is when you know, Angel Jibreel السلام, he took him all through the heavens and gave him like this immaculate tour of what the hereafter will look like, almost like a window into the future. It was said that the Prophet ﷺ was brought two vessels, one that was filled with wine and one that was filled with milk. Okay? So Jibreel ﷺ, he came and he served the Prophet ﷺ with these two options. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, take, take whichever pick that you want, whichever one that you wish to take, take it. And the Prophet ﷺ, he chose the vessel that was filled with milk. And Jibreel alayhi salam, he told the Prophet ﷺ at that moment, he says, Verily, you have chosen the way of the fitrah, the way of your, na your nature, what you feel most comfortable with. And obviously all of us know that, you know, in the hereafter, in heaven, the permissibility of wine <laughs> is going to be a thing, right? That one is going to be allowed to indulge in things that they, in fact, 
withheld from in this dunya. But I want you guys to think why the Prophet ﷺ, he chose milk. Because he was so in tune with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had commanded him with, that even in the heaven, y'all don't think the Prophet ﷺ was in heaven at that point? Like, you know, he was there. He was witnessing it. But he still chose the option that he knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him naturally, right? He felt weird about choosing something that was against the, uh, the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? So the first thing that we have to define when we talk about sin and how it affects the heart is what is sin in the first place, okay? Anybody want to share uh, any thought about what sin is or what you think sin would be? What is sin in our religion? Anyone? Simple one-liner, what would it be if you were to define it? Bismillah. Uh, all the bad deeds that go against Islam and what's being taught to us through the Quran is sin. Okay, so all the bad deeds that go against the deen, uh, anything against what the Quran and the Sunnah teach us. Good? Okay, good. Anyone else? What is a sin? What constitutes a sin? Anybody else? Yes. Mm, any, any sort of deed that you do that after you do it, your heart feels naturally bad. Okay, good. Anyone else? Anyone else have a definition of sin? So the scholars, they share something very interesting with us. Imam al-Ghazali, he says that sin is the veiling of divine light from the heart. That the heart enjoys seeing the nur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But one who is very accustomed to sin, they make a habit out of it, then there is this veil that comes in between the heart and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it leads, as Imam Ghazali says, it leads to this idea of spiritual darkness and separation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And several other scholars actually kind of echo this definition. Um, Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, the famous you know, scholar of Qur'an, he says that sin is like a chain that binds the heart. Sin, I want you guys to think about like the heart, and I want you guys to think about something that almost ties it, that basically restricts it from beating. I want you guys to imagine that physically, if the heart was caused to stop beating, how uncomfortable would that person be? And so Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, he says that a person who continuously puts themselves in positions where they begin to habitually sin, it's like they've put like this lock, this chain around their spiritual heart that prevents it from soaring towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I want you guys to keep this in mind that every definition the scholars give us of sin, it always involves this idea of deprivation. Like your heart wants to do something and you're depriving it from something that it wants to do towards Allah. The heart enjoys seeing Allah, but by our actions, we prevent the heart from doing something that it enjoys doing. And Imam al-Shafi'i is so beautiful, he says that a sin is a breach of the divine trust given to mankind, tarnishing the soul and severing the bond between servant and creator. That subhanAllah, can you imagine something? And you know, I, I always think about this, that when a person goes up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment, and Allah will ask like, why? Why did you prevent your heart from being with me? And you're, you'll, you'll tell Allah, Oh Allah, I thought I was in charge of it. I thought that my heart was me. And Allah, will, Allah Ta'ala will tell us, No, 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 your heart was like an amana. It was a trust that I gave you for a period of time in the dunya. Why did you prevent it from being with me? And subhanAllah, the soul will not know what to say on that day. The soul will say, Well, I thought, you know, I thought I was... I thought my heart was mine and my own and nobody else's. And Allah Ta'ala will remind you, no, 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 your soul, your heart was actually not yours to begin with. Allah gave you every one of these vessels to keep as a trust during the duration of time He gave you in this life. And in the hereafter, Allah will ask you, what did you do with it? Just like He'll ask you, what did you do with your ears? What did you do with your eyes? What did you do with your tongue? Did you do justice to the blessings that I've given you? Or did you abuse every bit of blessing and grace that I gave you in your life? But the reality of sin, and this is you know, something that needs to be mentioned, is that sin is something that no one is free from, right? As the Prophet ﷺ, he says, 
that Kullu ibn Adama khata'un. He says that every son of Adam is going to sin. There is no doubt about it. There is not a single beating heart in this dunya that is exempt from that default, which is Kullu ibn Adama khata'un. You will sin. But then he says, Wa khayrul khata'in at-tawabun. He says, but the best, khayrul khata'in. I want you guys to really take that phrase in. Khayrul khata'in, the best of the sinners. Like if you were to kind of think about that statement, the best of the sinners, you think about the people who sin the hardest, <laughs> like the people who do the worst out of the sinners. What is khayrul khata'in? What are the people who are the best of the sinners? He says, At-Tawabun, the people who repent, the people who ask Allah for forgiveness. Why? Because you can't escape that reality. The reality of you being a human being. That initial you know, mistake that our forefather, Adam alayhi salam, he made, was something that every single one of us will struggle with until the end of time. You will always have the choice between right and wrong. And there are moments in life where you will naturally slip up. So the question is, do you, it's not do you sin or do you not? Because there's no person in here, inshallah, if there is, we need to shake hands with you after this class is over. But if there is any person in here who is free from sin, then clearly you are not what constitutes the, the description of being a human being. And so we need to understand that sinning, first and foremost, is conversation should not make a person feel bad. I want to preface today's session with that. That you shouldn't feel bad that you make mistakes. Yes, those mistakes should make your heart feel a certain way towards Allah, but you should never be made to feel like, oh, I am a sinner, so I'm naturally in this hated realm of God. That, oh, I, I made the wrong choices a few times in my life, so naturally I'm, I'm, I'm this horrible, desolate human being. Rather, in fact... In fact, a person who makes mistakes can be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala depending on the way they actually react to those mistakes. That's what makes a Muslim. Not the sin itself. There's always this famous statement by the ulama. They say, always disapprove of the sin, not the sinner. Why? Because it's a dangerous game to disapprove of the sinner. To always dismiss the sinner. To say, oh, this person is this and this and this. I want everyone to think about this for a moment. How would you feel if you were completely characterized by one mistake you've made in your life? At one moment, you slipped up. You lied. You cheated. You saw something that you shouldn't be seeing. And imagine a person draws an entire generalization based off of that one second in your life. Imagine how hurt you would be. And subhanAllah, sometimes we do that to ourselves. Like we are our own worst enemies. That, oh, I had a bad month, I had a bad week. Oh, that means that I guess I should just kind of pass up my salah, right? Like there's no point in me praying. What's the point in me making dua? When in fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you that literally come back, come back to me. Let's see how you react from this mistake. Right? And so, now I want to throw this question out there. What does it mean, right? The Prophet ﷺ, he constantly talks about this, right? There's, in fact, a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he says that, indeed, when the believer sins, when the believer continuously sins, there is like a speck, like a black dot that appears on their heart. And if he repents, if he truly feels bad, and by the way, repentance is made up of a few different things. Repentance is made up of a few different steps, and we'll talk about that inshallah. And they refrain and seek Allah's forgiveness, then the heart is polished and is cleaned. And I want you guys to think about the time in the life of the Prophet ﷺ where that happened, right? Where he was quite literally, a few times in his life it happened. The first time it happened, according to a lot of the scholars, is when he was a, when he was a kid, he was a toddler. And he was under the guardianship of, of, of Halima as Sa'diya, radiallahu anh. And she was there, and, you know, and, and she said that she, you know, the Prophet at this childhood stage of his life was playing with all her own kids. And all of a sudden, you know, uh, her, his, his you know, stepsister, you would say, or foster sister, 
She was playing with him and all of a sudden they saw two men clad in white, donned in white clothing. They came and they laid the Prophet وسلم, down. And subhanAllah, I don't know what it feels like to have like angels perform open heart surgery on you, but I'm assuming that this is what it looked like. That they literally went into the chest of the Prophet وسلم, they took out his heart and they cleaned out any sort of imperfection within it, put it back in, and they reconstructed the, the, the chest and they left the Prophet وسلم, there to recover. And this happened later on in his life as well, before his famous journey that we talked about a second ago to Jerusalem and from Jerusalem to the heavens. That Jibreel alayhi salam asked Mikhail, the angel next to him, bring me a bowl of zamzam so I can wash out his heart. Right? So a human being has these, these spiritual specks on their heart. And he says that, however, if, if the person increases in their sin, that spot in their heart begins to grow like a cancer. It begins to fester and grow and multiply until it covers the entire heart. Y'all ever seen, subhanAllah, y'all ever seen like those, those images, those medical images of like a smoker's lungs? Like there's no telling if that's a lung anymore. Like it has no substance of, of a human lung. It looks almost dead. Like subhanAllah, I remember when we were in school and we used to see those images as like those like drug-free weeks that everyone gets so motivated by. And we're like, subhanAllah, man, like, and we would always wonder, we're like, is this, like, how did this person live? Like, how, even while they were alive, how were they alive? And subhanAllah, think about how shocked we are to see those images. And I want everyone to think, if we were to be able to see like a, a, a scan of our spiritual hearts, like what would they look like? Would it have a tiny speck on it? Or would it look like almost unrecognizable to the eye, right? And the scholars, they talk about the hardening of the heart, that the heart's supposed to be soft. A heart that's close to Allah is supposed to be soft. But a heart that is you know, used to, to, to sins and, and, and growing away from Allah, it begins to become hard, right? So what does it mean to have a heart that is hard, okay? We'll talk a little bit about that, inshallah, in just a second, okay? So, how do sins harden the heart? Anybody? What do we think? How do sins harden the heart? We've told, we already said that they, 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 they do harden the heart. But how do they? How does a person's sin harden their heart? Yes. Mm, okay, very, very good, right? So this numbness is almost like synonymous with the passing of life, right? Like you no longer feel anymore. And this is why people will say that, you know, when they're going through difficult moments in their life and they say, I feel so numb, right? Like I feel so numb. I eat food, but I don't taste it. Like I see things, but I don't like, I, I don't really take it in, right? This is what numbness is. Very good. Anyone else? Yes. Like, let's say, like, you're accustomed to, like, scam, scamming people and, like, taking their money and stuff like that, mm. right? Well, you'll be like, oh, like, I'm going to keep on getting away from this. I'm going to keep on getting away from this. Mm. Nothing is ever going to catch up to me. And, yeah, maybe you might get away from it in this life, but, you know, Allah knows what's waiting for you afterwards. So, I feel like it's something that, like, kind of steers you away from it. And also, like, you start believing in the power of the sin, not in the power and the fear of Allah. Mm, subhanallah, right? You know, you mentioned two very powerful things. One is like this idea of invincibility, where like you just feel like, oh, like it's just me. It's just a part of my life, right? I'm never going to get caught for it, okay? And the second thing is that people who, you know, feel like, oh, I, I, I'm, I'm too into it. I can't get out of it, right? So I might as well, you know, like that, that feeling of when you dig a hole so deep that it's hard for you to get out of it now? So you just decide, I might as well just continue digging, right? I'm in so much impermissibility, I'm in so much haram, what's the point of me going back? How many times you guys heard that statement before, by the way? That I feel like my sins are so heavy, is there any point in me even turning back around? It's almost like I've written myself off in this life, okay? Yeah, very, very good. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, it's also when you repeatedly do a sin to the point where it gets to people don't feel it anymore. Mm. And then that's when the heart gets hard and it doesn't like recognize that it's a 
bad thing anymore because it's so used to it. Subhanallah. Isn't that so scary about the world that we live in? Like, oh yeah, I mean, alcohol has some benefits, right? Like, one time I remember I was in a, <laughs> I was in a, I was in a, I think it was like a college uh, lecture when I was doing my undergrad. And I remember the professor was, it was like kind of like a communication slash like public speaking class. And the, 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 the professor put us into groups to argue very, very hot topic, you know, debate, you know, questions and, and prompts. And so the prompt that we landed on was, you know, uh, is cursing a, way, a, a form of intellect or is it a form of a bad habit? And so, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, I was on the side of it's a bad habit. So I was like, all right, cool, Quran, here we go, right? Uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, the other group and, you know, the, the whole task was whether you believe it or not, you have to defend that case. Just like, this is, by the way, may Allah ta'ala protect us all from lawyers. I mean, um, but you have to defend certain things that you don't even believe in, right? And so the, the, the opposing team was actually arguing that opposite part. And they were so passionately talking about, they were like, Oh yeah, you know, actually cursing is a form of intellectual freedom and creativity and it allows you to express emotions in a healthy and unique way and blah, blah, blah. And I was just thinking to myself, I was like, man, they feel so passionate about this, right? Like, and then at the end, the professor asked, like, where did you get your resources from and why did you defend your, the way that you defended? And the opposite team, they said that we actually believe in this. And I was like, subhanAllah, man, like, and, and it proved to me and one thing that I thought about after it was over, I was like, I don't actually think these people believe in it. I think that they're so surrounded by this reality that they just think this is true, right? That I can't distinguish between what's good and bad anymore. I just think that I'm so immersed into it that it's just normal for me now, right? Very, very good. Taysir, you had one. Yeah, very good. You lose the sense of guilt that Allah Ta'ala gave you, right? Y'all ever met those people that would like master a lie detector test? You're like, whoa, whoa, whoa wait, wait a second. Like, there's no, there's no distinction between truth and lie anymore, right? It's all the same, right? It's like those people who brag about being good at mafia. I get really kind of alarmed. I'm like, subhanAllah, brother, are you the cop? Are you the nerd? I don't know. Uh, you know? And then they start bragging, oh, I'm really good at this game, by the way. I'm like, all right, noted, red flag. <laughs> I was kidding. If you're good at Mafia, may Allah bless you in innocent games. Um, so, okay, good. Very, very good. Anybody else? Anybody else have? Yes, Bismillah, go ahead. Yes. Right. People start to kind of mathematically break down their sins, right? Like, oh, so minor sins, major sins, right? Not, not too big of a deal. I can just fast on the day of Arafah and it'll be good, right? Like, Muslims start mathematically breaking down their, 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 their wrongdoings. Um, again, I get it, mashallah, everyone majored in some sort of mathematic field in this life, but like, that's not the way spirituality works. And I always tell people there's something very fascinating about this is that this is the reason why in the Quran and the Hadith, you will never find any sort of lingo that mentions that deeds are counted. They're always weighed, Right? That means that no matter you know, how your life turns out, whatever deeds that you decided to do, whether they be good or bad, they'll be weighed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the mizan, on the scales, right? You can't count on scales. Scales are not functional for counting quantifiable amount, but they are there for qualitative purposes, right? They're, they, they're, they're there to weigh your deeds, right? Not to count them. So, you know, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he actually uh, gave a few points about the, the, the effects of sin on the heart. And I want you guys to think about one thing. That, that sinning comprises of two things, okay? Number one, it comprises of a little bit of carelessness, right? Because not every single person's sins are deliberate. I mean, how many of us sitting here right now, we've made mistakes, not because we actually, well, like, like, basically oppose Allah's commands, but we made a mistake in a moment of weakness, Right? So that's one. Moment of carelessness, a moment of heedlessness. And this is why, by the way, in the Quran, Allah constantly, constantly warns believers against being people who are heedless, right? Ghafla, 
Ghafla is like the sense of doing things without really thinking about them, right? We just do, we just act. We don't think about the, the intentions behind it. And this is why, in the mal'amalu bin niyat. Think about, your, think about your intentions. Your intentions will dictate your actions. And this is why even Allah warns in the Quran, people who seemingly do righteous deeds, but there's no substance behind it, right? الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَاهُونَ They pray, but they're heedless in their salah. الَّذِينَ هُمْ يُرَاءُونَ They do it so other people can see them, right? They do it so people can say, oh wow, what a pious person. Look at that guy reciting Baqarah in his Isha Salah, mashallah. Like, what an amazing person. But while we're reciting all these heavy verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take away any substance from your life. You know what's crazy, subhanAllah, there's a hadith of the Prophet where he says that on the day of judgment, and this is like interesting, on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring forth in front of him a man, rajulun saminun, like a fat human being. Okay? It's kind of a funny, like, kind of worded hadith. But on the day of judgment, this man who's visibly large in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will weigh more than the wing of a fly. And it's like such a scary narration to think that in this dunya, we saw these deeds as such heavy things, but on the day of judgment, they'll be worth lighter than the wing of an insect. Like, how, how does that make a person feel about their entire life? life's work that they built up in like their portfolio, right? May Allah protect us. So Ibn al-Qayyim, he says that there are a few things that are, you know, that, that, that determine the hardening of a heart because of its sins, okay? Number one, one of the ways that sins, they harden the heart. Ibn al-Qayyim, he says that they prevent sustenance. He says just as taqwa or God consciousness brings about rizq in life, the abandonment of remembering Allah causes the lack of sustenance, okay? And the Prophet ﷺ, he said that there's no believer or sinner, but that Allah has decreed provision from the lawful. If he, has, if he is patient until it comes to him, Allah will give it to him. If he becomes impatient and consumes that which is not allowed by Allah, Allah will decrease his provisions from the lawful. And I want you guys to think about this. And consumption happens in different forms. It's not all about eating. Think about consumption of money. Where do we get our money from? Consumption of, of, of eyes. What do we look at? Consumption of the ears. What do we hear? And think about how that may play a role in depriving you from other parts of your life. There was actually a famous scholar who wrote this very beautiful you know, book. And he said that I noticed that you know, when I was obeying Allah, when I was doing things that Allah would want, I would go home and my family would be happy with me in random things in my life. But I remember the days where I disobeyed Allah, the days that I sinned, I would go home and I would get into arguments with my wife. I would go home and my kids would be unhappy with me. And for a long time, I thought this was mere coincidence. Oh, you know, it's just chance, right? The days that I make mistakes, the days that I commit sins, the days that my wife or my wife's unhappy with me, oh, it's just chance, right? It's, it's a coincidence. And then he started realizing, subhanAllah, these things are very much tied together. The days that I, that, that I obey Allah Ta'ala are the days that my family is happy with me. The days where I you know, make sure that I pray on time are the days that my children are happy with me. Because as a Muslim, you, you're not built to believe in chance and coincidence. As a Muslim, you believe in purpose. You believe in meaning behind the different things that happen in your life. Not to say that, oh, like, you know, you're, you're there to kind of like draw parallels and do the equations yourself, but there is meaning behind certain happenings in life when it comes to sustenance and risk. So he says, the prevention of risk in a person's life. Number two, another harm of, of sin and how it hardens the heart is that it prevents obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know, he just drops one line about this. Check this out. Y'all ready for this? He says, if there was no other punishment for sin other than that it prevents one from obeying Allah, that would be sufficient in and of itself. That if, if, and he wrote about like 20 of these. He says, if I didn't write any more of them and sin, all it did was it prevented you from obeying God, I would end my book right here. That's enough of a punishment for a believer. 
that they don't understand the sweetness of obeying Allah. They don't, they, when Allah Ta'ala tells them to pray, they don't pray, that's enough of a deprivation right there. Okay? Then he continues and he says that sins weaken the heart, the heart's will and resolve, so that the desire for disobedience becomes strong and the desire to repent becomes weak. SubhanAllah, and you guys echoed this so much in our conversation. That when a person is so used to sinning over and over and over again, it makes it so that the desire for disobedience becomes strong. Y'all ever felt that in your heart before at, at, at any moment of weakness that became perpetual? That I've been doing this wrong deed so often that I somehow, some way feel an inclination towards doing it. I don't know why. I want to cheat. I want to lie. You know, it's crazy. SubhanAllah, we, in, 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 in this building, I've had conversations with people who come up to me and they're like, you know, I, I, I'm a pathological liar. I don't even know why I lie anymore. At any given moment when I have the choice between telling the truth and the choice to lie, I just choose lying. I don't know why. It's not, like, it's not like I don't know that it's wrong, but I just feel this inclination towards doing that. And Ibn Qayyim, he says on top of that, this person, their willpower to repent becomes weak. They don't feel like asking Allah for forgiveness anymore. Why? Because they're so deep. They're so deep into the deep end of the pool that they have forgotten that a shallow end actually exists. One of my teachers gave me a beautiful analogy. He said that when a person gets so used to sinning, it's like them jumping into a body of water that they began to slowly kind of from the shallow end walk deeper and deeper and deeper until their feet can no longer feel the bottom of that, that earth anymore. And they swim out into that water and they swim so far in that when somebody calls them and says, hey, listen, man, just come back the way you went. And that person will say, no, 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 I forgot, I don't know, there's no way out of here anymore. And the caller will be standing on the ground and say, no, no, just come back the way that you went. I can see the earth underneath the water, I can see it underneath you. And that person will say, I don't remember what it felt like. So I must just be in here to, left, to, to be left to die. You know, and, and, and we sincerely make dua, we ask Allah Ta'ala for protection from from ever feeling that way in our lives. I mean, he continues and he says, and this is a big one. He says the servant continues to commit sins until they become very, until the sin becomes very easy for them. And it seems insignificant in their heart. And this is a sign of the dying of the heart. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an Imam Bukhari, he actually collected the statement of Ibn Mas'ud in his book. He said that that great companion Ibn Mas'ud, he said, indeed, the believer sees his sins. The believer, think about what the, what the definition of a believer is. The believer sees his sins as if he was standing at the foot of a mountain, fearing that at any moment it will all fall on him. That like a believer looks at whatever sins that they have as a mountain in front of them. And they're so afraid that at any given moment, oh my gosh, this thing's gonna fall and topple on top of me. But a person who sins continuously, they see their sins like a fly which passes by their nose and their face, and they try to remove it by their hand once in a while. So a person who sins, it, that person's sins can far outweigh the sins of a believer. But to them, the sins are just like flies that, wa that, that fly across your face. You just swat it away. But for a believer, they look at their sins and they're like, SubhanAllah, look how big they are. Look how lofty my sins are. I need to begin talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about them. Do you see the difference of mentality here? I wanted to share a really interesting story here. You know, and a lot of us, how many of us like feel this statement. Have y'all ever asked yourself the question, like how did I get to this point? 
You ever, if you feel that, like you began with something small and then it grew and then it grew and then it grew and all of a sudden you have this really almost uncontrollable situation in front of you and you have no idea how it went from A to Z like that. Like you started with something so small and all of a sudden you have like a very, very serious, you know, impermissible situation possibly in front of you. And it all began with that DM. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Y'all didn't think I was going there, did you? Um, but no, seriously, you know, how did it get like this, right? So subhanAllah, you know, there is this incredible lesson that the Prophet sallallahu he taught his companions. He said there was a story of a man who was extremely pious, a very pious man. And he was not only pious, but he was trusted amongst his, his, his community. I want you guys to imagine you know, a person in your life like this, right? This person is, mashallah, like they're good with Allah, they're good with people, everyone trusts them, everyone views them as like a very safe person to be around. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says that one day, these three brothers in his community they were about to embark upon a journey. And they had a sister at home, like a grown person, a grown woman. They were all adults and they lived with their sister at home. And they were thinking to themselves, you know, who should we ask to take care of our sister while we're away? And so they think about him and his name was Barsisa. And they say, okay, you know, we should ask Barsisa. Obviously, this is a no-brainer. He's such a good person, good reputation, reputable guy. Let's go ask Barsisa to, you know, uh, look after our sister while we're away. And so they approach Barsisa and they say, hey, Barsisa, can you look after our sister while we go on this journey? And Barsisa, you know, he was a man of fitrah, right? So, like, he was a very, very close person to Allah. And he was like, ah, you know what, like, I don't know. And, you know, subhanAllah, I'm going to share something very important here. A big part of understanding, you know, what sin is, is understanding your own limitations. How many times do people test the boundaries of their own limitations? And this, by the way, the limitations, Allah has generically drawn up everyone's limitations generally, but a believer should also know what their own weaknesses are. You understand? I'll give you an easy example to follow. A person who wakes up for Fajr very habitually, it's okay for them to maybe not set an alarm. They just kind of leave the, 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 the window cracked just a little bit. They know what time it is for Fajr, right? But for another person, that rule may not apply, right? For me, I need an alarm clock because I just know that's the way I am, right? I can't just say, oh, well, you know, my natural fitrah will wake me up, right? Nobody in here agrees to that. <laughs> Unless, mashallah, you're like a wali of Allah and Angel Jibril shakes your hand every morning. Um, for most of us, that's not the case, right? So Barsisa was a man who knew his limitations in the beginning. So he was like, um, yeah, I don't know. Like, there might be a better person for you to ask. Is there, like, maybe, actually, maybe it's more appropriate that you ask a sister in the community to go check up on your, on, on, on your sister, right? That'd be much more sensible. And so Barsisa, he denied the request. And so the brothers, they go off. And the Prophet ﷺ, he says, and this is where shaitan starts to slowly, slowly turn the screw. He says shaitan began to eat away at Barsisa's mind that night. How did he do that? He came up to him and he said, Oh Barsisa, you're this pious person. You're well grounded. You believe in Allah. Don't you think by you denying their request that now they're going to go up to somebody who is less qualified than you? They're going to ask someone who's less qualified than you. They're going to ask someone who's less reputable than you. So perhaps you denying them is actually a source of fitna. And so Barsisa says, oh my God, subhanAllah, you know, like what have I done? So he goes up to these brothers and he says, okay, 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 I'll, I'll watch over your sister. And he says, but I have some rules, I have some regulations, I can't go beyond these boundaries. And so, okay, what are those boundaries? He says, well, I will make sure that she's okay, but I will have no contact with her. I just don't want to put myself in that position where like, I have this opportunity to like, mess up. I don't want to mess up like that. And so the brothers, they agree. They said, okay, khalas, you know, fine. Just make sure that she's okay while we're away. And so he says, I agree to these terms. And so the brothers, they go on this journey and Barsisa, he begins 
you know, that, that, that responsibility. So the first day goes by and Barsisa, what he does basically is that he cooks food and he leaves it out in public, in like a public meeting space where the sister can come and basically claim the food and go back to her spot and he can go back to his spot. No harm, no foul. Continues this for a little while and Shaitan comes to Barsisa again just like he did and he says, hey Barsisa, like isn't this kind of weird? Like don't you think that it would be of the manners of a Muslim to go and deliver this food to this person instead of just leaving it out in the open? And also, you're asking her to come out in public? What if something happens to her? Like why don't, why don't you be a gentleman and go and deliver it? And so Barsisa is like, Okay, fine, I guess, makes sense to me, right? So he goes up to, you know, uh, the next day, he takes the food and he drops it off at the door. He drops it off at the door and, you know, he says, this is it, I'm never going to go any further than this. This is my final, you know, this is my final, you know, the, the limit that I'm willing to go to. And so that night, Shaitan comes to Barsisa and he says, Barsisa, isn't it of the adab of a Muslim to like knock at the door and let her know, say salam, right? Say salam, man. Like this is what this is what Allah would want of you. And so Barsis was like, no, you know what? Like I don't I don't feel comfortable with that, right? I already broke a couple of my rules. And Shaitan says, no, 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 Barsisa, you'd be doing something that Allah would like. Shaitan's conniving. Did I ever tell you guys a story about me, you know, in, in, in giving my one of my first khutbahs I've ever given? And I stepped up on that member and I said, man, Shaitan is so good at what he does. Uncle brought me to the side after his Jummah Salah was there. He's like, Bida, don't ever compliment Shaitan. I was like, okay, noted. <laughs> but um, I stand by my original statement. Shaitan is good at what he does. Allah wouldn't have made him weak. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, think about it, guys. Like, the, 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 reward is worth the, the, the reward is worth the test. Like, if Shaitan was like, hey, man, like, forget about Fajr. And you're like, uh, no, you sound dumb. I'm going to pray Fajr. And Shaitan's like, ah, right, you got me. Right? Like, no, no, no. Shaitan would be like, ah, but you worked so hard last night. And you're so tired. That water's so cold. Right? Like, that's why he's good at what he does. And so, but he said now, next day, he knocks on the door. And he's like, you know, the woman opens the door. And she says, oh, you know, I, I didn't know that you are going to, you know, knock on the door. And he says, no, I wanted to say salam to you. Right? Etiquette of a Muslim. Assalamu alaikum. She said, Wa alaikum salam. Cool, alhamdulillah, I'm done. Next day, Shaitan's like, Man, like, you're such a weird person. Aji Barsisa. She's like, What now, man? Like, what do you want me to do now? He says, Don't you think that she's lonely? She's like, You know, she, she's been away. She's been by herself for so long. And subhanAllah, man, like, don't you think it would be of the adab of a, of a host that's making food for her to check on her, see how she's doing? Say, you know, say salam, say, you know, say how, how's life, how's work, how's this, how's that. And he says, ah, you know, I, I guess, I, I mean, I already said salam, I might as well, you know, ask her how she's doing. And so, long story short, check this out, this is insane. Again, this is a hadith, the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ says he never lies about these things. He says that Barsisa went in and he began to con converse with her to a point where even some of the scholars, some of the muhaddithin, they say that Barsisa began by talking to her from across the room. Like they used to like talk from across the room and eventually it became closer and closer and closer and closer. And unfortunately, you know, the reality of the hadith was that they were both guilty of committing zina. And at that point, not only zina, but she became pregnant with his child. And at this point, a man who began by being so reputable thought to himself, what do I do? I messed up. What do I do? What do I, I can't have my reputation squandered by this event. What, what do I do now? And Shaitan says, Barsisa, man, if you want an easy way out of this, you got to take care of your problems. And Barsisa says, what are you talking about, man? He says, yeah, you got you to eliminate your issues. And so Barsisa actually, Hadith says that Barsisa ended up killing this woman. He ended up killing this woman and he buried her in her own home. And so when these three brothers, they came back, they came to Barsisa and they said, Barsisa, where's our sister? And he says, my, my greatest condolences, my, 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 my most heartfelt condolences. 
I was not able to, you know, she, she fell ill and subhanAllah, I had to bury her. She was so sick, she passed away. And so I buried her out in the fields for you all to be able to, you know, pray and make dua for her, etc. That evening, those brothers, they saw a dream. What we call like ilham, right? They're not prophets, so they can't get wahid, but they can get inspirational dreams. And so they receive ilham, this dream that their sister is not actually buried out in the fields. Their sister is actually buried in their own home. And so they go out into the fields and they dig up the grave, the supposed grave in the fields, and there is no body there. And they find, they dig up in their home and they find their sister. And they run to the court and they say, Oh king, we know he's guilty. Deal with him, put him in prison, kill him. He's done such a grave sin. And shaitan comes to Barsisa one last time. Check this out. And he says, Barsisa, man, like you got yourself into a huge ordeal. And Barsisa says, man, forget you, bro. Like, are you kidding me? Everything you've told me to do has turned like, against me. Like, wh- like I-, I was a good person. And shaitan says, I have, look, I mean, you're going to die. Either, either you deal with this or you're going to die. And he said, what do you mean deal with this? And he says, I have one last option for you. One last option for you. He says, what? He says, you can bow down to me and I will make all of these issues go away. And the hadith says that as Barsisa bowed down to shaitan, Allah Ta'ala took away his soul. And he passed away in prostration to shaitan himself. This, I don't want you guys to think that this is like the standard. <laughs> like everyone in here is like, oh my God. I gotta rescind all of my DMs after 12 a.m. Like, what do I do, right? Like, of course you should, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I don't want you guys to think that obviously this is the standard, like, you know, outcome for everyone. But what this hadith it shows you is that sin is something that is not so, it's not something that is so apparent all the time. So many of us begin by, oh yeah, it's not that big of a deal. And all of a sudden, before you know it, this thing has turned into an animal that you no longer recognize. And then you look in the mirror and you no longer recognize yourself. And something that you thought that wasn't a big deal now has made you a person that you no longer have any feelings towards. And you ever wonder like where that hopelessness comes from? That hopelessness comes from the fact that when you look in the mirror that you no longer like the person looking back at you. You see a person that you no longer affiliate yourself with. And so the goal of a believer is to begin feeling again. To not make yourself numb to the mistakes that we make. And the, 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 the ulama they give us a few ending advices on how to allow yourself to feel again as a believer. And I want everyone to really key in on these points. The first thing that the scholars, they say, is number one, identify the areas in which you tend to commit your sins and be honest about your weaknesses. You know, a person who is in denial of their weaknesses will never be able to get out of the sins they commit. If I can admit that I have a problem with lying, I will never be able to heal myself away from that disease. If I can admit that I have a cold, I will never be able to take the correct medication to solve that issue. First and foremost, I want everyone in here, before even thinking elaborately, Think about the weaknesses that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created you with. Some of us are more inclined towards certain sins. For some of us, those sins don't really matter. Like how many of us, subhanAllah, we think about it, we're like, oh man, like for me, oh man, like for, for, for me looking at things that I shouldn't be looking at is one of my biggest hardships. For the person sitting next to you, they're like, yeah, never, never, really, never really struggle with it. But for that person, another challenge is going to be their biggest thing. 
That's not relevant to the other person. You know, like, it's, it's an uncanny how detailed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created everybody with. How much detail Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created everybody with. Your sin, your struggle is so different than the person sitting right next to you. You may look similar, you may breathe in a similar way, you may dress in a similar way, but those two people struggle with such different things in their life. And that is the way that Allah created you. Own up to it. Acknowledge that weakness. That's number one. Number two is seek knowledge. Seek knowledge about what is okay and not okay in Islam. You know, this is one of the biggest things. How many people ourselves, we're guilty of being like, oh man, no, I don't think that's that big of a deal. It's okay. It's not that big of a deal. It's fine, right? And sometimes, subhanAllah, and I'm going to be a little bit kind of blunt and, 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 and rough around the edges today, but some of us even use Islam to almost neglect our own hearts. Oh, Allah forgives, brother, don't you know? It's all good. I can just, you know, do this and Allah will forgive. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of the brothers of Yusuf. وَتَكُونُ مِن بَعْدِهِ قَوْمًا صَادِحِينَ Oh, after we throw Yusuf down a well, ah, I'll be straight. <laughs> I'll pray Asr. Chill. Maghrib, Isha, I got you. Just after I do this. <laughs> we have to stop using Allah's deen as a means of neglecting our souls. We have to stop lying to ourselves. We have to be very knowledgeable of what we do. Don't deny it. If we struggle, it's okay. Don't deny it. And this is that whole justification culture that a lot of us have kind of been very exposed to. Oh, no, 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 I do this because of this and this and this and this. You don't know me, man. Only God can judge me. Yes, like we're not saying that people have a right to judge you, but also you can't just keep on saying that, oh, no, 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 it's not that big of a deal. I know the, the reason why I do what I do is this and this and this and this. No, no, no. Admit, okay, I struggle with this. I have a problem with this. I know that it is wrong. You know, there, one of my teachers, he said that maybe the first step to recovery is being honest and admitting that you do have faults. Maybe that admittance is the first step to overcoming those difficulties, those sins, those challenges, right? The third thing, oh, this is, this is deep. Ibn Rajab, he says this, he says, guard your senses. Guard your senses. What does that mean? Anyone know what that means? Guard your senses. Be yes. Yeah. Be conscious of your senses, of your eyes, your ears, your tongue, your hands, your feet. Be conscious of them. Y'all ever like? been down that rabbit hole of YouTube related videos and TikTok videos to the point where that guy comes up on your screen and tells you that it's time to go to sleep? You're like, oh my God, the app is telling me to go to sleep and wake up for Fajr. How, what am I? Right? Like, we have to be aware of like our, our, what, we, what we do with our body. You ever think that Basisa ever thought in his own life, ever in his wildest dreams and imaginations that he would ever allow his eyes to gaze upon what he gazed upon, or his ears to hear what they heard. Like you can't imagine that. But where does that loss of sense come from? It comes from a person just being, being super casual. Oh, it's cash, man, don't worry about it. It's all good, it's okay, right? Be aware of your senses. The last two that I'll share, this is very, very important. Keep yourself busy. How many of us, subhanAllah, how many of us find ourselves to struggle with sins whenever we are doing nothing? Oh, we're just sitting there bored. We're sitting there and we have nothing else to do. Naturally, unfortunately, the heart inclines towards busying itself with things that are not good for it. Y'all know, y'all know, and, and, and this is going to tie into one of the last points, which is, Surrounding yourself with good people. And I'll tie the hadith in with both of these points. The Prophet ﷺ one time he said that, Verily, isolation 
is better than bad company. And he said good company is better than isolation. Know where you are in life. Assess where you are in life. If you have bad people around you, know that being by yourself is better. And if you have good options in your life, knowing that those people are better than being by yourself. The trick is that shaitan wants you to think that like, oh man, you can do this alone. You got this. Why do you think, why, guys, why do you think jama'ah is a thing? <laughs> why do you all think praying in jama'ah is a thing? Because Allah and His Messenger knew that if a person continues to test the waters of, of, of isolation, they would eventually leave their salah over time. Who do you guys think are the most consistent people in their prayers? The people that? They come to the masjid, man. You think that's just a coincidence? No, 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 no. That's, that's, that's purpose and meaning. Why? Because they've kept themselves with other people that are like-minded with that intention. Okay? And then the last thing I'll mention, and it goes along with this hadith, is be as... Try to be as open to the advices that Allah and His Messenger give you. And this specific hadith is actually something, it's about wudu, which is so incredible. Because we think to ourselves, like, oh, a sin, it, it, it makes a person, you know, it, it blackens and darkens the heart and hardens the heart. How does a person become pure again? The Prophet wasallam he said that when a Muslim or a believer washes his face in the course of wudu, every sin which he committed with his eyes will be washed away from his face along with the water or with the last drop of water. When he washes his hands, every sin which is committed by his hands will be effaced, will be washed away from his hands with the water or with that last drop of water. And when they wash their feet, every sin that their feet committed will wash away with that water or that last drop of water until he finally emerges cleansed of all of his sins. That the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will leave you absolutely pure. That when a person prays Maghrib, they don't think about doing something bad after it. When a person performs wudu, they no longer think about cursing that person out that they had a conflict with. When a person reads Qur'an, you think a person who reads Qur'an, they immediately want to watch the videos that are haram? Absolutely not. The heart feels so uncomfortable by that. Begin to immerse yourself with things that are pleasing to Allah. And famous teacher of mine, he said that when a person starts to do things that Allah loves, and even if they don't truly love it in the beginning, it's kind of like a habit that they have to build, it's only a matter of time that the beloved of Allah will become the beloved of the believer. You'll, you'll surprise yourself. Salah went from being a chore to now being my therapy session. Dua went from being a, 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 a very, very like small part of my life to becoming a cornerstone in my life. Quran went from being a text that sat on my shelf to becoming my life. Subhanallah, you know, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to get to that stage. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to never allow our sins to be those that define us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to always be hopeful of His mercy. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to always allow us, no matter how many mistakes that we make, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be people that turn back to Him, that have our hope in Him. Ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Wa nashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka. One or two of the day, which is awful. Khairan, everybody, thank you so much for being again present on another Thursday night. Alhamdulillah, here at Roots. Inshallah, you know, all of your efforts and your dedication and your, your, your mindfulness is, is rewarded. Inshallah ta'ala. Uh, next Thursday, starting next Thursday, I'm going to start implementing a new culture at Soul Food. But this is going to make the online audience a little bit salty. But inshallah, they'll, they'll get over it. Um, after Soul Food, the, the session is over. We're going to allocate 10 to 12 minutes of Q&A, inshallah. Um, and inshallah, we'll, we'll, we'll begin by kind of offering some anonymous Q&A uh, portals for people. So we'll display a little bit of like a QR code on the screen. So inshallah, we'll begin answering some very, very thoughtful questions uh, at the tail end of the Soul Food sessions. And I'll be cutting off live stream uh, to begin that Q&A session. Why, you ask? because I'm not trying to get hated on by the online audience for my specific answers, okay? Um, also, like online, like, online is just super fickle. Like, people, like, oh, 
Imam Safi said, music is halal. Um, no, 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 I didn't say that, okay? Like, I'm just explaining to a person who asked a question from a very specific point of view. So, inshallah, we're going to start instituting that, um, that culture, inshallah, starting next Thursday at Soul Food. So come, inshallah, with your questions, and inshallah, we'll do the best that we can to answer them in a good way. Okay? Jazakum khairan, everybody. Uh, salah is in another 10 minutes, so inshallah, y'all feel free to hang out here, and then we'll pray Maghrib together in just a little while. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.